You are watching The Ancient Landmark with Terry Jacobs from Southside Church of Christ. Tune in each week as we study God's Word together. And welcome to this, another edition of The Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs, and I'm so thankful to be with you at this time that we might open up God's Word and there stay together. Certainly is a wonderful thing when we can spend time in God's Word, and we might learn more about His will and what God would have us to do. You know, the uh, program is called The Ancient Landmark, and there we try to point folks back to the ancient landmark, that is, the spiritual landmark that's been laid out in the Scripture for us. And we need to be mindful of that. We need to understand that whenever it comes to the Scriptures, this Bible is our roadmap. It is our roadmap from earth to heaven. This book is the only book that tells us why we're, or where we came from and why we're here and where we're going when it's all over. This is the only book that tells us about our beginnings, tells us about Christ and His sacrifice for us, and this book is the one that's going to lead us to heaven one day. And so we need to spend time in it. We need to spend time studying and learning more about God's Word and His will. Don't push it to the side. Don't move it out of the way. Don't just leave it as some type of a decoration for your uh, coffee table. Don't just have it out just to hold old pictures in. Or don't just leave it just so you have a family record of, of births and deaths. But actually read it. Use it and follow it all the days of your life, and you'll be the better person for it, I promise. You know, whenever you think about the Bible, there have been so many skeptics, critics, uh, that have been against the Bible all through the years. And that being the case, it's always been interesting to me to find that, that those who've been critics, those who have tried to find uh, fault with the Bible, those who have tried to... Um, somehow disprove the Bible, have themselves been disproved. There was a fellow uh, several years ago, a, a, a Jewish man living in the 12th century, named Eben Ezra. And he was a critic of the Bible. He was someone who was opposed to the Bible. And in fact, he did everything he could to try to uh, destroy the, uh, the credibility of the Bible and saying that, that we ought not believe in the Pentateuch, that is, the first five books of the Bible. He spent his time there as a, as, a, as a critic of God's Word, saying that those things weren't true. Sometime later, we read about uh, other people through history that have done this. Voltaire was one who was uh, quite well known. Voltaire uh, was a critic of the Bible. He was someone who was uh, opposed to the Bible in the 1700s. And in fact, he, as he talked about the Bible and as he, as he um, discussed, as he published his criticisms of the Bible, he said, why in the next hundred years, he said, Christianity, the Bible and all will just be swept from the pages of history. He said, in the next hundred years, it would just completely be gone. And you know, after Voltaire died, about, when about 50 years after his death, that the American Bible Society bought his house and used his printing press to print Bibles. And those are just a, a few we could think of. There, there are others as well who have tried to say that, that the Bible is not true, that have been critical of it. And yet these people have been relegated to just a footnote in history while the Bible still stands, while the Bible is a perennial bestseller. It's always on the bestseller list, isn't it? And so there's still, the Bible still stands, isn't it? And that's just the truth of the matter. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35, Jesus made this statement, Matthew 24 and verse 35, that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. In Psalm 119 and verse 89, he says there, David says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And in fact, whenever you read your Bibles, in the book of 1 Peter, in 1 Peter, the, the epistle, 1st uh, epistle of Peter, chapter 1, and there, beginning about verse 23, down through verse 25, he talks about being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. Now watch this. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 
for all flesh, verse 24, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is a flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, verse 25, but the word of the Lord standeth forever. And this is the word which by the gospels preached unto you. He said the word of God lives and it abides forever. Then he goes on in verse 25 and says it endures forever. This word of God is everlasting. And again, we could, we could talk about different, uh, different men who have criticized the Bible, different men who have tried to say that the Bible is not true, tried to bring uh, and cast aspersions, bring uh, accusations against what is written in the Scripture. And yet those men have gone away. Those men have passed from the sin. And probably folks, folks like Ebenezer and Voltaire and some of those folks, maybe you haven't even heard of them. That's okay. You have heard of the Bible. And the Bible endures forever. The Bible stands forever. And in fact, in your Bibles, you can read of the importance of the Scripture. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17. In the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17. It says there that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is probable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All Scripture, he says, is given by the inspiration of God. The word inspiration there means God breathed. In other words, He breathed out these things. God spoke. And he says this word is profitable. It's profitable for doctrine, it's for teaching, for correction, for reproof rather, for reproof, which means having learned what God says, I've been reproved. I've been told, hey, wait a minute, you're doing something that's wrong. For correction, which means once I'm told what is wrong, I'm now told what to do to be right. And then for instruction in righteousness. Instruction, of right, instruction in righteousness means that now that I am doing what's right, these are the things necessary to stay right, to stay in God's favor. That the man of God, he said, may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished to every good work. And folks, whenever I understand this, I'll have understand, understood a lesson that the world has not learned yet. We need to understand that all Scripture is given for this purpose. We can be taught we can be reproved, we can be corrected, and we can be instructed in righteousness. Voltaire didn't appreciate that. Ebenezer didn't, uh, didn't appreciate that. And scores of other people who have come and gone did not appreciate that. And they tried to say it wasn't true. Uh, they tried to say that the Bible wasn't, wasn't right, that it wasn't real. Robert Owen was another one, well known in his day, in the 1800s, a well known a uh, person who would deny the Scripture and deny the existence of God. And yet my saying, Robert Owen, uh, probably many people say, that, who's that? And that's my point. Yet we know what the Bible is and, and we know who the author of the Bible is, don't we? And like I said, though, there have been critics all through the years. There have been those who have tried to say that the Bible is not true. And so for the next little bit, what I'd like for us to do is study about the Bible itself. The claims that the Bible makes for itself that it is true, as well as those claims and those statements that are made from other sources. Uh, what's commonly called internal evidence and external evidence. But in internal evidence that the Bible is what it says it is. Internal evidence for the Bible being true. And then we're going to talk about external evidence for the Bible being true as well. Because the Bible is a true treasure. God has given this to us. And this treasure needs to be respected as such. So let's think for a little bit, and let's study for a little bit about the internal evidence, the external evidence for the proof or for the validity of the Scripture. First of all, think about it from the standpoint of the internal evidence. When we think about internal evidence, we're talking about statements, we're talking about prophecies, we're talking about things within the Bible that shows that it is uh, without contradiction and in fact shows that uh, it is the truth. The works of men, in contrast, the works of men oftentimes have contradictions in them. 
I, I own different books and I've read different books where on one page there, one statement will be made and the next page another statement was made that contradict each other. You know, the creed books of men do this a lot of times too. Uh, for instance, the creed book of man that says that our salvation is solely by faith, uh, solely by grace, and then on the very next page says it is wholly by faith. Now, if it's solely, S-O-L-E-Y, if it's, S-O-L-E-L-Y, if it's solely by grace, that means it's only, that's it. If it's wholly, though, by faith, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly by faith, then that means it's completely by faith. Now, which is it? Is it solely by grace or is it wholly by faith? Which is it? You see the problem? Those folks have contradicted themselves right in their own creed books. Think about it. That's a work of man. But whenever we come to the work of God, whenever we talk about the Bible, the Word of God, we're talking about a work that is without contradiction. And in fact, these statements are true that you find here. And you can look into the Scriptures, for instance. There are 332 Old Testament prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. A few of them we will notice. We're not going to notice all 332, but we will notice some of them. For instance, in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, and in verses number 15, we read here of the first prophecy concerning Christ, where as God spoke with uh, Satan at this time, he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Notice, please, he says, I'm going to put enmity, separation, between thy seed and her seed. Now, anywhere else in the Bible you want to read about seed, seed is always on the male side of the chart. Seed is always what the male has. But in this case, he talks about it's going to be her seed, that and shall bruise thy head, he shall, thou shalt bruise his heel. Well, well, who is the her? Her seed. Well, we're talking about Mary, aren't we? And in fact, in Isaiah 7 and verse 14, it says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So, once more, you see that prophecy. That's just another prophecy. Isaiah 7 verse 14. Those things being fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1 when it talks about Mary uh, bringing forth her firstborn son, having never known a man. And yet she, from a virgin birth, virgin conception, I should say, has now given birth to this, the Son of God. See that? And there's other passages as well that talk about this. You, you can look in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 22. Psalm 22 takes its place as a passage that, that speaks of the Lord's crucifixion. Among other things, whenever you begin to read there, in Psalm 22, in fact, Psalm 22 is what is the passage which Jesus is referencing on the cross. Whenever he says, Jesus is on the cross, and he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, some people take that, and they say, well, that means that, that God uh, turned away from Christ, and God wasn't there then. There, there's nothing can be further from the truth. That's not what he was saying at all. Jesus was quoting Psalm 22. Psalm 22 and verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And as you continue to read this psalm, what you find is, he says that he, what, he did not forsake me. In fact, that was, the, that was the key to this thing, was the fact that he had not forsaken me, and he had not turned away from me. But he says at that time, and there's an interesting thing here, that's read in verse 14, Psalm 22, verse 14. He said, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax that is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me to the dust of death. Dogs have compassed me, and the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. Verse 16, they pierced my hands and my feet. What is he describing there? That's the description of the crucifixion of Christ. And here some thousand years before Christ, he talks about they pierced my hands and my feet. Psalm 22, verse 16. 
thousand years before Christ in the time of David crucifixion was virtually unknown. And it certainly was not something done as a means of capital punishment or anything like that. That was, they, they folks didn't do that. It was the Romans that crucified and that perfected that form of to torture, that form of execution. The Romans did that. And now, he says, they pierced my hands and my feet. And what happened to Christ? They nailed him to a cross, pierced his hands and his feet. They sure did. And again, you see other passages. We could read Isaiah chapter 53. And Isaiah 53 there touches on this, obviously. And, and those familiar with this, read Isaiah 53 in the first 12 verses. And you're going to read about the Lord coming. And how that whenever he is here, and he, would born, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Chastised but of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now, all we like sheep have gone astray, and we've turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And on and on that goes, talking about what's going to happen to the Lord. And how he's going to be numbered with the transgressions, the Bible says. Verse 12, he was numbered with the, with the transgressions, and he made his grave, it says, with the rich. And how that uh, he made intercession for the transgressions. And on and on that goes. You see here these things being stated. Now, do we find this in the New Testament? We absolutely do. Here's Jesus Christ who comes, and whenever he's crucified, he's numbered with the transgressions. He had a thief on either side of him. Whenever it says he made his grave, it says with the wicked. With the wicked, that means he died with those folks, and he did. But with the rich in his death, verse 9, Isaiah 53, the rich in his death. Don't you remember Joseph of Arimathea and how that he's, he laid Jesus in his new tomb? It was the tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had bought, and yet Jesus' body was laid in there, a new tomb where no man had ever been laid, and they put him in there. There with the rich in his death. See that? And then, of course, to resurrect that third day. And over and over we see this. I'll give you another example of, a, of Old Testament prophecy pointing to Christ. For instance, in the book of Ezekiel. In the book of Ezekiel, and there you read about how that the Lord how that, uh, I'm sorry, not wasn't Ezekiel, Zechariah. And you see, that's why you can't trust the words of man. You can't always trust the words of man. you got to go and you got to check this out for yourself. You need to read these things. So I hope you're taking notes. And I hope that you're following along with what's being said. Make sure these things are so. Because I can be wrong just like anyone can be wrong. But the Bible is always right. And that's my point. Zechariah 11 and verse number 12. He says, I said to them, if you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Does that sound familiar? Yes, that was the price of the Lord uh, in that uh, betrayal price. 30 pieces of silver, that's what Judas wanted. And then he goes on, he said, The Lord said to me, Cast it to the potter, a goodly price that I was prized out of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Zechariah 11 and verse 13. And whenever I read Matthew chapter 27, and I learn what happened to that thirty pieces of silver, and how Judas took that, and he cast it down in the house of the Lord, in the temple. And how that they took that, and they took that money to buy the potter's field, to bury strangers in. Then I see the fulfillment of Zechariah 11 and verses 12 and 13. That's what I see. And so over and over again we see that these prophecies, and these are just a few that we could name, uh, th these prophecies, 332 prophecies of Christ that are fulfilled in the New Testament. Not might have been fulfilled, not that kind of sketchy about it. They were actually fulfilled, and we can see proof positive. Yes, these things happen. Yes, these things occur. So I, I use this as just one example of how the internal evidence screams that the Bible is true. The internal evidence lets us know in no uncertain terms that the Bible is not contradictory, and that the Bible it tells us what the truth is. 
and that we can follow it. God in His providence made these things possible. And we need to respect that. And I'll tell you something else. Whenever you think about the Bible from internal evidence, don't forget also that there is a continuity to the Bible that is really a special thing. This, the Bible displays a continuity that no other book has. Think about this for a moment. Do you know how many writers wrote the Bible? Do you know how many people it took to write the Bible? It took 40 people. 40 writers of the Bible. Now, let's just say for a moment that you and I were going to write a book. Let's just say we're going to write something. What would be some ideas? Maybe it's going to be a collaborative book and it's going to take several authors. And maybe we're going to write about mathematics or we're going to write about uh, some theory or whatever or, or maybe on history or whatever the subject is. And we say we're going to have five authors, ten authors. Each one will write a chapter in this book. Now what might be some criteria for writing this book that we're going to write together? You say, well, what would be, well, if we're going to have, a, have some writers, we probably ought to pick some folks who are about the same age. Probably that might be a good idea. We could have some a little bit older than us, perhaps, or, and maybe some younger, but, you know, right general average age would be about our age. And you say, well, what else could be done? Well, probably a good idea to get it accomplished fairly soon. You know, we don't want to spend a whole long lengthy period of time trying to write this book. We've got to get it collaborated, put together so we can get it to market. Well, that'd be a good idea. And we might talk about it and we say, you know, we all need to um, maybe be from the same country. That'd be a good idea. Maybe the same state. Maybe the same city. But we would need to be at least from the same country so we would all speak the same language. That'd be a good idea too, wouldn't it? We wouldn't want to have a book that, that was part English, part French, part Chinese, part Japanese, and, all, and then try to put that together and hope someone's going to buy it. Whenever maybe they couldn't read, but maybe one chapter or two or three chapters in the whole book. Why well, we would want to be from, the, at least if we're not from the same country, at least all of us agree to write from the same language. That would be a good idea too, wouldn't it? And, and a biggie would be this. If we're going to work on this all together and have this collaborative effort for this book, it seemed to me like it would be a good idea that we're all living. That would be a good idea too, wouldn't it? We'd, we'd all be alive and write this book. And yet whenever I look into the Scriptures, and that helps us with continuity, but whenever I look into the Scriptures, what I see is a book that was written by some 40 different men from all walks of life, all places of life. It was written in uh, over a span of some 1,500 years, 1,600 years. It was written in three languages. It was written on three continents. And yet all of it laid out in such a way that one goes to the next. There's a, there's a continuity. There's a flow to this that is a beautiful thing. Somebody says, well, I'm not so sure about that. Are you sure about some of this? Well, sure. Uh, this is the way that it is. The authors of the Bible came from all walks of life. Think about the apostles. The apostle Peter was a fisherman, wasn't he? He wrote part of the Bible. The apostle Paul was a tent maker. Remember that? Remember part of his work? And he was an educated man. I'm not saying he wasn't educated. But he was a tent maker. The Apostle Peter, though, was a Galilean. And Galileans were known for not being educated. Acts chapter 4. Furthermore, when we think about the, their various walks of life, don't forget that David wrote part of the Bible. David was a king. Daniel. Daniel was a prime minister. And yet the prophet Amos, Amos was a herdsman. The gatherer said more fruit. We find that when it comes to these various ones, various writers of the Bible, they've come from all different walks. Samuel was a prophet and a judge, and he, he was there raised in the temple. And yet we find others writing 
and others who did not have that kind of upbringing. And so you see this varied lifestyle. Matthew was a tax collector. Remember that? He was a publican. He was a tax collector for the Romans. And again, we see Solomon being a king. We see Isaiah, a statesman. And over and over that goes. All different walks of life these, these men came. And all from different ages, different periods of time. I mean, Isaiah was long dead before Matthew came around. Or, or Peter, Paul, some of those. David was long dead before Isaiah came around. Moses. Think of him and the writings that he did. And so God uses these different men for the purpose of revealing His Word, revealing His will to us. We think about the fact that when it comes to these uh, folks, they wrote from various places. Jeremiah wrote from a dungeon. The Apostle Paul, he wrote from prison a lot of times. You see Moses writing. Moses would have done most of his writing in the wilderness wanderings. That's the time he would have done most of his writing out in those 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Daniel's writing in the king's palace. And you, you see different aspects like that. Luke was a physician. Luke was a doctor, Colossians 4 tells us. And he would be writing on his travels. But there's a continuity. There's a beauty. There's a flow to this that we need to appreciate. Again, there's three different continents. Asia and Africa and Europe. Those three continents where the Bible is written. At the same time, three different languages. And the three languages are Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. And so when we look to that, we see how that the Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew. That was the Jewish language, wasn't it? And that was the, that was the language of that time. But Aramaic was also a language that was that was spoken quite commonly there. And, and Jesus would have spoken Aramaic and would have been familiar with that language. And part of the Bible was written in, in that uh, language as well. And then finally, the Greek language, Koine Greek, which is what mo most of all, uh, most if not all of the New Testament is written in the Koine Greek. It's a dead language. It was uh, there spoken in the first century. Well, we're coming up on a break, and I want us to continue in this study, the internal evidence of the Bible, and study these things together. I hope this has been interesting to you, and I hope it will continue to be as we go and, and talk about more of this internal evidence. There's so much of it. and shows that the Bible is the truth. The Bible does not contradict itself. It does not lie. And we need to follow it, believe it, and obey it all the days of our life. You stay tuned, and we'll be right back in just a moment. You have been watching The Ancient Landmark. Write to us at 2920 New Hartford Road, Lawrenceboro, Kentucky, 42303. Visit our webpage at www southside churchofchrist.com Our Sunday morning Bible class is at 9.30. Sunday morning worship is at 10.20 and 6 p.m. Sunday afternoon. Wednesday night Bible class at 7 p.m. Write to us for a free correspondence course and a subscription to the Old Pass, our teaching bulletin. Make sure to tune in to our radio program, What is Written, from 12.30 to 1 p.m. Sunday on 94.7 WBIO and continue to watch The Ancient Landmark on Monday at 9 p.m., Wednesday at 5 p.m., and Thursday at 11 p.m. And we're
we're back again. We want to continue in our study of God's Word and talking about the treasure of the Bible. The fact that the Bible is uh, true, the Bi fact that the Bible has given us uh, a, a what, it, what we find here is the fact that when it comes to God's Word, it is reliable. It is without contradiction. It is a book that uh, is without error. It is without any falsehoods from lid to lid. And we've talked about that some already, and we want to continue in that. We talked just a moment ago about the fact that here is a book that's been written in three languages, Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic. Earlier on, we talked about the fact that if you and I wanted to, to write a book, we'd probably write it in the same language with folks about the same age, uh, living about the same place and, and around the same time period. But here we find that a book that has been written over some 1,600 years by 40 different writers from three different continents and three different languages from all walks of life. And I might also add the fact that when it, when it comes to the Bible, the Bible was written in different time periods uh, from this standpoint. From the fact that David, for instance, David was at war many times when he was writing. David was a man of war, you remember. And yet Solomon wrote uh, the Proverbs, the Song of Solomon. He wrote Ecclesiastes. He, he writes these books while at peace. And so there's different time periods in which they, they were living all of this uh, situation. You can go on and see that Daniel wrote. Whenever Daniel was writing, he was a captive while with the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians. He was a captive. Uh, we forget that a lot of times, but he was a, he was a slave. He was one that was taken from Jerusalem and taken and, and forced to serve in the Babylonian court. And yet, whenever he writes these things, he is writing as a captive of the Chaldeans. Again, when we think about Elijah, we think about Elijah and, and his bravery. And he did write some things down, by the way, the Bible talks about some of his writings, and not only was he there, but many others who were writing in various time periods. Here is the apostles, the apostle Paul, the apostle Peter, John, who wrote from the Isle of Patmos. Uh, all of these wrote while under Roman oppression, while being uh, under the, the substitute of the Romans. And now, here we have God's Word completed for us. Here is God's Word written in the Hebrew language, the Aramaic language. We talked about that, that Jesus spoke the Aramaic language. The Greek language, the Koine Greek, and that was that's a specific type of a Greek language. And it's a dead language now. And, and what dead language means, we didn't get to discuss that on the first half of the program. The idea of a dead language means that it is... The, the word meanings have not changed, and they will not change anymore. The English language, in contrast, the English language continues to change in meaning. There are new words added from time to time, and all of that. And so it adds to the language. It is a living language. In contrast, such languages as Koine Greek or the Latin language, those are dead languages. There's no, no one's adding to those. There's no new definitions. No, whatever the definition of the word was at that particular time when it was being used, that's what it means today. So also, that's the case with the Koine Greek. Whatever it meant in the first century, that's what it means today. It hasn't changed at all. And it's not going to change because it is that dead language. Furthermore, we see that, uh, and that helps us in our Bible study, because if we go back and look up original words uh, that, that are found, especially in the New Testament, whenever you look there and look up those words, you're not going to go to a Webster's Dictionary. You're not going to do that. That's defining English words. What we'd want to do is go back to a Greek Dictionary. We would want to go back to like a Vines Dictionary or to a Thayer's Dictionary. Those that specialize in that Koine Greek language and then to define our words from that. That's the right reference, you see. Because that's the language that was being used. The reason I bring these things out is to show us the continuity of the Scriptures and how that there are no errors. All this internal evidence shows the truth of God's Word and shows us why we can trust it today. 
Not only is there ample evidence for that, but what is interesting to me is the fact that the Old Testament, or rather the New Testament, refers to the Old Testament on many occasions. And so again, we see a, a harmony here between Old Testament and New Testament. I'll give you an example of this, and, and, and a few of them, but one of them is in Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew chapter 21, and the verse is number 42. Jesus is speaking at this time to his apostles in Matthew 21 and verse 42, and he asked the question, he said, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now that scripture... It's found in Psalm 118. Now that's what he's talking about. But Jesus, now, again, a thousand years removed from David, and Jesus talks about the Scriptures. He says, have you not read the Scriptures? And they're quotes for us uh, from passage from Psalm 118. And so here we see this, not only in this passage, but just keep on reading. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 29, Jesus, when he spoke to the Sadducees, said, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. And then he goes on and talks about, uh, uh, here a passage uh, in verse 32. He says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That is a passage found in Genesis 25 and verse 8, Genesis 49 verse 33, Genesis 35 and verse 29. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So again, Jesus quotes from the Old Testament. Can I trust the Old Testament? Can I trust what this Bible says? Absolutely. And this is one way we see it, is through this continuity, through the fact that, that one harmonizes with the other, and back and forth like this. Again, Matthew chapter 26, and, and, and verse 54. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 54, after Jesus has said that he has the power to call twelve legions of angels, he said, but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? In other words, I have to go to the cross. You remember earlier on in our study, we looked at such passages as, as Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 and others like that that said Jesus has to go to the cross. So he says, I could right now call down twelve legions of angels. He said, but then how can the scriptures be fulfilled? The scriptures uh, he is referring to are these scriptures uh, of the Old Testament. Matthew uh, chapter 26, verse 56. All this was done, it says, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. That all the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. These are why these things happen. And again, you see this uh, repeated over and over again. I'll give you another example. In the book of Luke chapter 24 and verse number 44. In Luke 24 and verse 44, now after Jesus has died on the cross, after his death, his burial, his resurrection, he is now resurrected and walking the earth. The Bible says he walked the earth after his resurrection for about 40 days. During that 40 day time period, Luke 24 verse 44, he said to his apostles, he said to them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So from the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, he said, concerning me. And when we're familiar with that terminology, basically Jesus just summed up the whole Old Testament. Law of Moses, prophets, and Psalms. And that's the way they had divided it back then in, in, in those days. And so Jesus says, the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament, he said, that was written concerning me. Now think about that. We think about that and see just how important this is. In John chapter 2, in the book of John chapter 2, uh, here uh, we see this once more. Uh, this uh, fact that these scriptures that were fulfilled. The fact that in John chapter 2, verse 22, it says, When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus said. They believed the scripture because they believed on Christ. What, what had happened? The Old Testament said he's going to resurrect, and sure enough he did. He was risen from the dead. See that? And so we see this over and over again. Jesus referred to many Old Testament books. 
We read uh, in, here in, in the New Testament, not only the words of Christ, the words of the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, and others here that refer to different Old Testament books, like Isaiah and the Psalms. They refer to the words of, of Joel. You see that? They refer to the words of me, the apostles, Elijah, or prophets, I should say. They refer to the prophets like I, Elijah. Uh, in the book of James, we read about Job. Remember, it talks about the patience of Job there in, in James chapter 5. And you just see this over and over again. There is no question that the Bible is true. There is no question that we can believe, that we can trust what the Word of God has to say. If I didn't look at anything more than the internal evidence, I'm going to see that that is the case. I'm going to see that that is true. It was the Apostle Paul in Acts 17 and verse 2 that reasoned with folks from the Scriptures. In the book of Acts chapter 17 and the verses number 2, he says here, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. That's the Thessalonica. He went in unto them and for three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Out of what Scriptures? Out of the Old Testament Scriptures. But those Old Testament Scriptures that pointed to Christ. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, same chapter, Acts 17 verse 11, says these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. Here the Bereans, it says, were more fair-minded, and they would listen to the apostle, but they also looked to the scriptures to see whether or not those things were so. And like I said, we can just go over and over again with multitude of examples showing the need for the scriptures, the re references made to the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can trust the Bible. We can trust what it says. It is a true treasure. And we need to appreciate that. Here we find, for instance, in Galatians chapter 3 and Galatians chapter 4, references being made to Abraham and to Sarah. Now, these are uh, showing the continuity. This is showing there are no contradictions here in Scripture. It's not the fact that you have folks from Old Testament days and then you come to the New Testament and they're called by different names or they're called uh, not even the right name. It's not the fact that you have certain uh, stories or certain things, accounts happening in the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, contradicts it somehow and says, well, those things weren't true or, or leaves us with the impression that perhaps somebody made them up. These are not legends. The Bible is not a book of legends. It's not a book of myths. It's not a book of fairy tales. This is a book that tells us and teaches us the truth and we need to respect it. We need to be thankful to God that he has given us such a book. That he has given us the truth. Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And this word is a word that can be trusted. This word is a word that is real. It is quick. In Hebrews 4 and verse 12 says that it is quick. That means it is living. It is alive. Quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And that discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart has been active for many, many years. Hasn't it? And whenever we think about the all the effort that's gone into this, God breathed these words, and these men wrote them down, oftentimes in danger of life and limb, oftentimes in poverty, oftentimes in sorrow and sadness. But they wrote these things down, and they wrote them down that we today might know, and we today might be able to take these things and live by them and be faithful to God and one day see heaven when this life is over. Folks and friends, that means a lot, doesn't it? This means a great deal when we think about what it is to read the Bible. It is special. And it's far greater than any collaborative effort that you and I might put together. It's far greater than that. And it means so much. And we need to appreciate that. Even go to the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, uh, that book in particular is very special. Did you know that the book of Revelation 
either alludes to or quotes some 400 references out of the Old Testament. Now, whenever I realize that this book is only 22 chapters long, we're talking about uh, a minimum of 20 re allusions or 20 references per chapter. We're talking about a great deal here, aren't we? And so we're seeing how that, that anyone with a knowledge of the Old Testament is going to be able to key in on the book of Revelation, is going to be able to understand the book of Revelation and see it for what it truly is. Because whenever you can understand the Old Testament, you're going to understand this New Testament book. It was written in, in a, an apocryphal language. All that means is uh, that it is written with symbols, signs. It's not, not a literal thing. It's written in a figurative language. But even written in a figurative language, it has eternal truths for us that we need to appreciate. And if anyone could ever find a contradiction... It would be here in the book of Revelation. And yet when you look here, you see the continuity. You see the truth. You see the consistency all the way through. Folks and friends, this is not a book of legends. This is not a book of myths or fairy tales. This is a book that has the truth in it. And this is the only book that has the truth of God in it. This is the only book that God inspired men to write. Now, I recognize that men have written a lot of books. And men write some very good books. Right behind me are some good Bible study books. And that's fine if you have books like that at home. But please understand, those books were written by men. And those books were written by men who were not inspired of God. They weren't. As much as they love God and, and, and appreciate God and all of that, and as much as I love God and appreciate God, God's not talking directly to me like He did with those folks in, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It's just not happening. Today, Hebrews 1 and verse 1, He speaks to us by His Son. And His Son has the, His words written down in this book. And so whenever a man writes, we always compare what a man says in light of these scriptures. Whenever I speak, I hope that you compare what I speak in light of the scriptures. Whenever your preacher speaks, I hope you compare what he says in light of the scriptures. You know what? Because men are not inspired, but this book is. This is an inspired book. And so, you have a Bible at your house, you need to treasure it. You need to open it up, read it, study it, learn it, and just have that and just dwell in it. Have that just fill you all the way through because that is the book. This is the book that's going to lead us from earth to heaven. It's that kind of a treasure. It's that special. And we need to appreciate this. You look and you see other examples of God's trustworthiness. The trustworthiness of the Bible. You think for a moment about God's plan for the home and the family. That the fact of us having one man and one woman for life, living as husband and wife together, and in that relationship, husband and wife, in that relationship, raising children. Hebrews 13, verse 4. That relationship that is talked about in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 25. Friends, the, the idea of, a, of what's in America has been called the nuclear family, the, the idea of a husband and wife and 2.5 children that is not the result of a Puritan idea. That is not the result of Western thinking. That's not just an invention that happened in the 50s. That's not just something that happened, you know, some years ago that somebody thought was a good idea. Rather, this, uh, uh, the plan for the marriage, the plan for the home, is God's plan. It's what God intended. And I haven't found anyone who's been able to improve on it. To have a husband and to have a wife, there and their commitment to one another, love one another for life, through thick and through thin, for better or for worse, till death do us part. In Romans chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, talks about the fact that marriage is for life. And if I can understand that, I can see God's plan here. And nobody's been able to improve on that. No one can make it better than that. That's what God wanted. You see that? So this is not a, a myth. This is not a, a fairy tale. We see the trustworthiness of the Bible because God says this is the best way. And it is. It's not good for man to be alone. 
So he said, I will appoint a help meet for him, a helper suitable to him. And that's exactly what God gave Adam. And since that time, he says, a man shall leave father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. See that? And Jesus added this in Matthew chapter 19, saying, Wherefore there are no more twain or two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Let not man separate. We need to appreciate that. You talk about the trustworthiness of the Bible. You talk about the truth of the Bible. You talk about what it means from the internal evidence. What is given, what is stated in this scripture. We need to appreciate the fact that prophecies, not only prophecies concerning our Lord, but other prophecies were not only stated but fulfilled. And we find that to be true as well. I'll give you a few examples. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 13, in the book of 1 Kings in chapter 13, there came a time when the northern and southern king, northern side and southern side of Israel split. They became the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And in so doing, the king of the northern tribes, his name was Jeroboam, he was worried because he was afraid that if the people would leave the northern kingdom and go south to Jerusalem for, the, for worship at Jerusalem, that they would get homesick, they would see their friends and others, and they said and he, he was worried that they would want to reunite, and then, of course, he wouldn't get to be king anymore. God said that wouldn't happen, but Jeroboam was still worried anyway. So what Jeroboam does, Jeroboam just decides he's going to make idols. And so there was an idol at Dan and one at Bethel, the far northern end of the, of the kingdom, the far southern end of the kingdom. And the Bible says that a day came whenever they dedicated this idol at Bethel. 1 Kings chapter 13, there, he said there was a prophet that came. And the prophet there says, uh, came and stood by the altar, and he cried against the altar. In 1 Kings 13 verse 2, and he said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burned upon thee. And the altar was split in half. The ashes spilled out. He said, That's the sign that this is going to happen. And sure enough, that's exactly what did happen. Well, then... There's a prophecy set there. What happened to that prophecy? What about Josiah? Was there anyone named Josiah? Was there ever a king that did this? Well, if you fast forward in time, about a hundred years, in 2 Kings chapter 23, and the verse is number 16, the Bible says there was a king named Josiah. And Josiah in 2 Kings 23 and verse 16 Josiah turned himself, and he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount, or in the mountain. And he sent, and he took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them on the altar. Does that sound familiar? Some hundred years earlier, in 1 Kings 13, he said Josiah is going to take the priest of this high place and burn the bones on this altar. 2 Kings 23:16. That's exactly what happened. So we see that not only were prophecies concerning Christ, we gave several prophecies already, but not only prophecies concerning Christ, but other prophecies were stated and shown to be true. Yes, friends, you can trust the Bible. You can trust it for the internal evidence that is here. Here's another example we'll look at. In the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 28, and Isaiah 44 and verse 28 speaks of a man named Cyrus who's going to come and going to rule. And in verse 4, chapter 45, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, there we read about him again. And it says, Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, I will loose the loins of the king to open before him the two-leaf gate, and the gate shall not be shut. And he goes on and says what he's going to do, what God is going to do with Cyrus as the ruler. He says, Cyrus is my anointed. In other words, Cyrus is the one I have chosen for this work. I have chosen for this duty, for this purpose. He is going to be the king. 
You know what's interesting about this? This passage is, is quoted. This passage is, is written down. Isaiah 44 verse 28. Isaiah 45 verse 1. And names the king a hundred years before he's even born. And you know Cyrus would be the one from the king of Persia and the Medo-Persian Empire. Remember that? And the Medo-Persian Empire is the one that destroyed Babylon. God speaks of the destruction of Babylon here in Isaiah 44 and Isaiah 45 and names the king who would lead the people and would defeat Babylon and names him a hundred years before it ever happened. Question, did Cyrus ever rule? Yes, he did. Was he one responsible uh, there for defeating Babylon? Yes, he was. Did he do exactly what God said he was going to do? Yes, he did. So if I can trust these prophecies, as being true. If I can trust the prophecies of Christ, 332 prophecies of Christ, and see them fulfilled, don't you know you can trust the Bible to tell you about your home and your family? Don't you know you can trust the Bible to tell you what to do to be saved through faith in Christ Jesus, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized? Don't you know you can trust it? Don't you know you can trust the Bible to tell you about the Lord's church? Don't you know that you can trust the Bible to tell you what to do and how to live to be faithful in the sight of God? And even passages like Matthew 7 and verse 12, it says, Whatsoever you would the men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Don't you know we can trust God? And we can trust that word that teaches us how we ought to treat other people and know that it'll work. And know that, that, him, that him that stole steal no more but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things that is good that he may give to him that needeth. Ephesians 4, verse 28. If I can trust those things, and I can trust the prophecies, I, can, I know this is not a book of myth. This is not a book of fairy tales. This is not a book of, uh, of fantasy. But this is the truth. This is the Word of God. And so, so much so that what's fascinating to me is the fact that whenever we, we study history, we study historical records, we find that many of the generals, many military leaders in times past, took their cues from the Bible. And they read about the various military exploits of Moses, of Joshua, of the other various kings. They took their, their cues, if you will. They took their military strategies and plans from the book of God. And they won wars. They won battles and they won wars in doing those things. They sure did. Now, do you think that a military or a military leader, a general, whoever it might be, would do something like that and would put his troops and would put his nation in jeopardy based on a book of myths and fairy tales? Of course not. But I'm going to tell you what. You look at the military campaigns of Joshua, of Moses, some of these others of the Old Testament, those who have fought in one war, you're going to see folks who did something that was real. It was true. It's factual. And it can be trusted. And we've looked quite a bit at the internal evidence. That is that which is within, that which shows no contradictions here within the Bible itself. We've looked at many prophecies, we've looked at statements of fact, statements of scripture and all of that, and shown from internal evidence the claims that the Bible has made for itself. Lord willing, on our next program, on our next study, we're going to look at some of the external evidence. The external evidence that shows that what the Bible claims is true. In other words, the Bible makes certain claims. The Bible says certain things. Is it true? Are there certain historical figures? Are they real people? Certain nations of, of people? Are they real nations? Did they really exist on earth? The external evidence says yes. And Lord willing, on our next study, on our next television program, we're going to talk about that external evidence and show the Bible to be true yet again. And so I hope you tune in at that time. Until that time, though, we'll bid you good day and God bless. You have been watching The Ancient Landmark brought to you by Southside Church of Christ, 
2930.